All right. Well, last night we were supposed to go from 7 to 8.30, and it was about 10 minutes to 9. <laughs> Sorry, preach. Before we got out, I'm going to do better tonight. I'm not going to keep you as long. Um, I really, really battled and struggled um, to get our anatomy, quiz, anatomy physiology quiz done, and I did not get it done, so we will not have a quiz tonight. On Wednesday night, we will resume our anatomy physiology quiz. I apologize for that. No meeting tomorrow. But um, there's no meeting tomorrow night. Our next meeting will be Wednesday night at 7. And so we want to have more people coming out Wednesday night at 7. And then the last two meetings will be at Sabbath at 11 o'clock and then Sabbath afternoon around 2.30. So we're going to begin with our simple natural, we're going to have two meetings tonight, a simple natural remedies class, which will require your participation. I'm going to have, I'm going to ask for volunteers in the, in the, out of our, our group here to come up and, and to assist. And then we are going to have a short break and then go to our subject of the evening, our main lecture of the evening. Um, so let's just start with our simple natural remedies class. Um, by the way, what does it, what does simple mean? Plain. Plain. Easy. Easy. E easy. Somebody else. Original. Oh. <laughs> I don't know about that. It means, what does it say on the screen? Easy to understand, not complicated. So simple natural remedy is going to be something that if you look at it once, you can do it. You don't have to have a big notebook and pen and write all. You look at it and you say, you know what, I can do that. I can do that. So it needs to be simple. There's a reason why we were told that our, this is what we need to do. What does natural mean? What does natural mean? She, what, say it again? I said God made it. God made it. Natural means, what does it say? As it occurs in nature. As it occurs in nature. Not man made. So, yeah, or not man made, not synthetic. It didn't come out of a laboratory. It's something just as it occurs in nature. There's a reason why God said that we should use simple, natural. One of the reasons why he said simple is because when something is really simple, no credit goes to the practitioner. Nobody's saying, oh, you're so smart, you're so great. They're just saying, here's an herb, it's going in your front yard, dandelion, put that in the pot, cook it, drink it. <laughs> and you get the person that gets no credit for it. Who gets the credit? The person who made the dandelion herb gets the credit. So there's a reason, and you can go to health classes, and you have to add 17 different anti-cancer herbs, and you have to do this plus that. It's complicated. You say, oh, she's such a wonderful therapist. That's not what God wants. He said it needs to be simple. It needs to be natural. Natural is important because everybody doesn't live in Europe, in America, and has thousands of dollars in their pocket. Some people live in very poor places, very harsh conditions, and it needs to be accessible to all people all around the world. So God says, go out in nature and get it. I made it for you. It says in Psalms 104 and verse 14, Psalms 104 and verse 14, that he calls it the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man. He calls herbs to grow all over the world for the service of man. So when you go into the deserts in California and you see chaparral for miles, you know somebody around here must have some cancer. Cause that's the most powerful anti-cancer herb there is and there's miles and miles of chaparral so god has caused these things to grow so that he can get the credit it's in his laboratory not man's laboratory and what is it what is a remedy what does the word remedy mean Solution. say it again it means it truly fixes the problem you know nowadays allopathic medicine we talked about that last night they have treatments. They'll start you on blood pressure pills and you have to take those pills all of your life. 
they'll start you on insulin and you have to take those shots all of your life. It doesn't really cure the problem, doesn't, no, doesn't fix it. But what we've been given, our message is simple natural remedies. It goes to the root of the problem. It actually, when you do it properly and God blesses it, mm -hmm. you don't have to do it anymore. Sure. You put the herb back on the shelf and you go about your business because God has fixed the problem. So we're taking the class, backing this all up. And what is our class called? Simple Natural Remedies Class. Simple Natural Remedies Class. All right, so um, tonight um, we're going to have Simple Natural Remedies for Inflammation. Inflammation. And we'll tell you what that, what inflammation is in just a moment. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to make a little poultice, a little clay poultice. And I want to show you that poulticing is in the Bible. This is the divine endorsement. Here is this in John chapter 9. There was a man that was blind. Jesus could have just spoke the word and he could have seen. But he did not do that. The Bible says that he took spittle and clay and he made a little clay and he anointed that man's eyes with it and he told him to go wash in the pool Siloam. And the Bible says that when he went and washed, he returned seen. So here is an example of Jesus who could have just spoken the word using a simple natural remedy through which his supernatural power was worked. Another example is 2 Kings chapter 20, also found the same story in Isaiah chapter 38. It's the story of a king named Hezekiah who Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, get your house in order, you will surely die. By the way, it was God's will for him to die. The message came from Isaiah, from God that you're supposed to die. And what did Hezekiah do? You know the story. He prayed and begged for extra time. He turned his face to the wall and was praying. And while Isaiah was leaving, God said, turn around, go back and tell him I've added 15 years to his life. And God changed. He modified his will. It was God's will for him to die. He says, okay, I'm going to modify my will. I'm going to extend your life. And he, created, he committed a tremendous sin after his life was extended. He'd probably been better off just accepting what God said. But one of the, the, the wonderful things in the story is God listens to our prayers. He will modify his plans if we pray. Isn't that good news? Amen. God will change. He'll say, you know what? Might not be the best, but we'll take this path here. We'll take the path that you suggest. That's what God says to us. And um, when he was sick, Isaiah went back, and the Bible says that he took a lump. You look that word up in the Hebrew, a pressed together cake of figs, laid it on his problem and um, the boil, and he um, recovered. So here's another example of simple natural remedies. Just another example in the, um, the book of um, Job also. Uh, Job had boils, and he was sitting in ashes. It's like a charcoal poultice. He was doing things that cooperated with him. So we're going to be doing tonight three very simple remedies for inflammation. What is inflammation? It's when the blood vessels, the lymph system, and the cells react to a irritant. When you get, um, and that inflammation is protective. It's trying to heal the problem. It's trying to remove the irritant. If you get a splinter in your body, sticks in, this is a magnified close-up of it, white blood cells start coming through, the, through your system, they go, the, the, the tissue swells, the white blood cells go, and they start killing germs. You will feel pain, there will be redness because there's increased circulation, and there will be warmth. So those are the signs of inflammation. And it's your body's attempt to correct some kind of an irritant. And it's a good thing that you have inflammation when you have some sort of injury. It's your body mobilizing itself. And it's discomfort, you know, it's painful, it's hot, it's red, it's swelling. You can't move that arm as well, but your body is um, immobilizing the arm so that you won't injure it further until 
it can be healed. And that's called acute inflammation. But sometimes inflammation that comes and is working to heal you kind of lingers around. And after the splinter is gone, you still have inflammation. That's a bad thing. That's called chronic inflammation. We're supposed to have acute inflammation, inflammation when we have trauma, but it's supposed to heal and go away. But if we don't have sufficient vital force, if we're not healthy enough, if we're too toxic, if we're not following the laws of health, if we're not going to bed on time, not drinking any water at all, our acute inflammation can kind of linger and become a long-term problem of chronic inflammation. And you see in this slide here that um, acute inflammation is when the body responds to current damage, but chronic is when the body continues responding long after the, the damage is done. It's still going on. I do a lot of work on my computer. I'm sitting like this, my head is forward, my shoulders are forward. I've been doing this for over 30 years. 30 years like this. And so my shoulder is forward. And I have discovered about a year ago that I can get my left hand behind my back, but this hand will not go behind my back. And I went to a physical therapist and they did all these tests and they said, your shoulder is forward. That's why your hand can't go up. You gotta get this back. These muscles are weak. These muscles are too tight. And I have a chronic shoulder problem right now that I have to address because I've been out of the posture that I should be for a very long time. Unresolved injuries lead to what? They lead to arthritis. They lead to strain back. They lead to, to arthritic hip. They lead to, they lead to um, um, heart disease. They lead to cancer. They lead to a lot of problems. Anybody that you know that's over 50 years old, chances are 80% of them have some sort of inflammation. They got something going on. A lot of people here that are under 40 years old have inflammation, chronic inflammation. And they can do a simple blood test called C-reactive protein, they take your blood, they put it on a test, they'll come back and they'll tell you the level of how much inflammation is in your system. It's a simple test. And when they see that C-reactive protein, they'll say, something is inflamed in your body. So I would tell people, you know, if you get an injury, um, I was in our yard and um, I was having to push a rock that was about this big. It probably weighed 250 pounds and I couldn't move it. So what did I do? I called my wife. <laughs> Baby doll, can you help me? She's like, I don't know. I'm like, we can do it, we can do it. So we're both on our knees and we're pushing this rock and she hurt her oh, back. Bow! I'm like, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have had you try to help me. And um, I didn't hurt my back, but she hurt her back. And she was thinking in a week or two, she'll be fine. Mm -hmm. It's been two years. She still has inflammation in her back, just like the picture is shown. How do you do reduce inflammation? You got to change your lifestyle. How do you reduce it? Change your lifestyle. You got to go. Matthew three ten. Now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. You got to address the things that cause inflammation. You have to eliminate inflammatory foods. Well, let's start with the first one. You need to drink some water. Amen. Amen. Mm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hmm. I talked with a friend of mine. This guy weighs 330 pounds. He can't drink eight ounces of water. He takes a bottle to work every day, comes home with a full bottle every day. And he told me, I got to put crystal light in it. You know what crystal light is? Yeah. I said, well, then put crystal light in it. <laughs> put something in it. Put some soda in it. Put something in it. But you got to, you have a lot of mass. You need to rinse your system and get all those toxins out. Drinking water is one of the number one things to do if you have inflammation. We need to stop eating foods that cause inflammation. What are those foods we're talking about? Trans fats, that's, um, that's vegetable oil that's cooked. What kind of oil did I say? Vegetable. vegetable oil that's cooked. And they put vegetable oil in all kinds of pastries, cakes, cookies, candies. We gotta stop eating a lot of meat 
dairy, cheese, these are foods that cause inflammation. We need to eat anti-inflammatory foods. Fruits, nuts, grains, vegetables, brown rice, sweet potatoes. Those are the things that grow in nature. Those things actually fight. The berries, all of the berries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, boysenberries, all berries are among the highest foods known in uh, um, antioxidant chemicals that fight free radical damage. So eat berries every day. Just get a little handful of some kind of berries. You can buy blueberries for three dollars, put it in, and just have just a little handful every day. It's like medicine. It will, it will just um, really tamp down the inflammation. Aerobic exercise rinses out those free radicals out of your system. It forces them out through the kidneys and then also through um, through just breathing deep oxygen. It, it, oxygen is an um, antioxidant. It, it kills things. Stress. If you get stressed, your inflammation goes up. And carrying extra body weight, you have higher levels of inflammation, so losing weight. So let's go to our first. That was our brief <laughs> lecture on inflammation. And we're going to go to a fifth um, uh, modality that you can use to fight inflammation, but before we go to this fifth one, who can name all six of the things we just mentioned that fight inflammation? You think you can name all six of them? You can look at your notes and then, then turn your notes over. You ready? You want to try? Okay, go ahead. Um, water, lose weight, um, <laughs> fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, anti-inflammatory foods, okay. Things that call inflammation, that's for? Um, drink water. You said that already? Okay. No credit. Good, good try, though. What else? And, uh, yeah, walk. Aerobics. Aerobics. And the last one was? Stress. 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 That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, you, you can't remember all of that unless you review your notes, but I encourage you to write down your notes and review it. You sitting here, you're listening, you're like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. It just goes right out of your head. You actually have to go and review that so that it goes into your thinking. All right. Clay poultices will also are very powerful means of fighting local inflammation. So I need a volunteer. I'd like to have a man. Could I have a male volunteer? Okay, are you volunteering someone else or are you volunteering yourself? Oh, come on up then. Come on up. All right, I need another man. He's going to be our therapist. Now I need a patient. <laughs> Who? What did you say? His name. Jordan. Jordan! <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Don't, don't let me wait long. Somebody else. Another male. Another male. Come on, quickly, quickly. Come on up. Come on up. I need another man. Jason, you coming? Come. Shaking his head? No. Oh, here we, here we go. All right. Oh, we got two now. All right, come on up. This is going to be easy. All right. So you're going to put, so, so he was out playing basketball. He fell. Ah, he got his, his uh, wrist is sprained. And so we're going to put a clay poultice on his wrist. So you, sis, your name is? Jane. Okay, you stand over here right here. You stand behind the yeah. counter over here behind the table. You're going to be our nice here. And I want you to just cut a piece of paper towel about this big. Can you give me a favor and give me a bowl of water? Yes. And then spoon. Secure and put it into the water. No, small water. You're about this big, okay? While he's doing that, we're going to go on with our lecture. Yeah, that's right. Now, a poultice, oh, thank you, Jason, for coming up. We'll put one on you, too. A poultice or a plaster is defined as the application. What does it say there? Oh, yeah. What does it say there? Drawing out poisons. The application of, what's these two words right here? Moist paste. A moist paste to the surface of the body. For what purpose? What does it say there in the yellow? Drawing out poisons. And what is the other thing in the yellow says? And also to? Put in healing. Put in healing things. Um, you, can make, um, you can make poultices out of potato. Just grating potato really, really fine so that it's a mush. You can't see the particles in it. And that potato mush is one of the best yep. poultices known to man. Uh -huh. 
The king of all poultices is charcoal. Yep. What's the king? Charcoal. charcoal. And the queen of all poultices is potato. Okay. <laughs> charcoal does, potato does everything that charcoal does. And a couple of things more. But it's not absolutely absorbent. I apologize for our delay. We didn't have our bowl here. I have everything but the bowl. As a matter of fact, what we might just do is we might just, since our bowl is taking so long to come. Anybody have a bottle of drinking water? I got you. Uh, we just lost two, uh, two uh, <laughs> listeners already. Uh, let's go on. So, um, poultices are good for removing toxins, putting good elements in, and potato. All right. Thank you so much. You need that. Up. All right. I like to use this. And potatoes are superior to charcoal poultices when it comes to burns. When it comes to what? Burns. burns. To burns. So charcoal is good for burns, bruises, sprains, um, uh, insect bites, um, snake bites. Potato can be used for all of those things. But when it comes to burns, you want to use potato rather than charcoal. By the way, you don't put charcoal on an open wound. You have to put it inside a paper towel because it will tattoo. It will do what? Tattoo. It will tattoo. If you put, if someone, and it depends on how dark their complexion is and where it is. If it was a dark skinned person and it was in a, a, a place that wasn't um, prominent and I didn't have paper towel, I would put it right on their skin. But you probably couldn't tell. It wouldn't discolor their skin very much. If it's a light skinned person and they have an abrasion right in the middle of their forehead, I'm not going to put charcoal right in the middle of their forehead and then they have the mark of the beast the rest of their life. They're walking around with this discoloration. No, you don't want to do that because it will tattoo. Okay, stir it up, brother, so it turns it too much. Stir it up, use your spoon. All right. A little bit more. All right, so. Um, I had a friend, his name was John Corrin, and um, he was a medical missionary from Australia, and he went to India as a medical missionary, and the doctor there in the hospital believed, just turn it, so I get a little bit of it, turn it to, uh, to a paste mark. We're trying to get it to look like this. Here. And you have to work it. Might put a little bit more water. He went to a hospital in, in, in uh, Pune, India, the doctor wanted him there. No one in the hospital wanted him there. He was there for one year. They never sent one patient to him. He came to work every day, no patients. And one day, a little girl, probably around nine or 10 years old, hot water fell on her. She had burns over three-fourths of her body. She was supposed to die. They said, take her to him. He wants to be a medical missionary? This girl's going to die. They didn't even have silverdine cream to put on her. They, they took, they brought the lid. The little girl was in there screaming her head off. She came in there, John said, go to the kitchen, and I want three gallons of grated potato. He's like, what? Go to the kitchen, give me three gallons of grated potato. And they grated this potato, and these uh, Indian guys, okay, that looks good, put it, in, put it, um, put a big um, size, like three quarters stack, right on top of that. Thing. So, so they're walking down the hospital, these attendants, with these big mounds of potatoes, bunches of them going down to his place, and so it started people falling out, what, what are these people doing with all this potato? And they go in there, the woman, the girl is still screaming, and the doctors came in and they said, you're not going to put that on this girl. He just said, thank you so much. You want to take her? They said, no, thank you so much. Dropped on his knees and he prayed, and he took that potato about an inch thick and laid it on her back. She immediately stopped screaming. He covered her whole body in a potato. Next the morning, when they went to turn out, everybody came and said, there's going to be pus. There's going to be pus. They pulled it up. No pus. He kept changing the potato poultice. She got completely healed without any kilo. In. They said it was a miracle that her skin didn't kilo. No silverdine cream, none of the standard treatments for, for burn. And after that, they started sending them patients every day because they said, this guy knows something that we don't know. All right, let's see what we did, how, how we're doing. Where's your, where's your spring wrist? All right. 
You're going kind of slow with that. Just, 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 don't, don't be cute with it. Just, just, all right. All right. So if actually it's a little bit dry, should be a little, put that on his wrist. How does it feel? It feels cold, wonderful. Because inflammation makes heat, and we want to cool that down. And so we're going to, and now we're going to put this. I want to see how neat you are. You let go of it, it's not going to fall. I want you to go around his wrist. Okay? And go around neatly. And I want it to be tight and neat. All right? And then after that, uh, oh, over the, yes, over the, over the. Alright, okay, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. It, it should be tight. And then you're going to take this to the plastic, not to the skin. So you're going to come here like this. Okay, Jason, I'm going to show you. Can I, can I do you? I'm going to go right on your skin. <coughs> you don't have any opening wounds there. And when would you use um, clay? Did you, did you write that down? So can you help me, please? Yep. Hand these out. Give one. Give everyone here. Um, and can you hand some out to the back of the room? Of course. And if you just turn to the very back sheet there, I'm probably not going to hand this sheet for a sheet, the very back page, it says clay poultice. Do you see that? And the second paragraph says clay poultices are used for, and it's bold. What does it say? Inflammation. Or when what? You need to be what? As in what condition? Cancer. So if you had somebody with cancer, they had a big tumor. You could lay a big clay poultice on that tumor and it would draw toxins right through their skin. Um, and if they had cancer in their system, like they had lymphoma where it's, it's all through their system, you would, you would put them in a clay bath. You would take them where you, they could be outside. You put a sheet of plastic on the ground and then you would get buckets of clay that you had on the stove that was that was warm, gently, not, not boiling hot. And then you would just paint their whole body from the neck to their soles of their feet with clay. And they would, that's called a clay bath. And they would be in there for several hours. Then you just hose them off outside. And so you're, you're drawing through the largest organ of elimination through the skin. So um, at the very bottom of your little tiny clay poultice section, it says that there are some cautions and there are contraindications where you would end the treatment or not do it. And what, is, what does that last sentence say? It says, if what? Hey, Irritation. Or what? Increase with the use of a poultice, what should you do? Discontinue immediately. And, you ne and I didn't put it on there. But um, yeah, I did, it's the paragraph above. It says, never, it's capital letters, put clay directly on skin which has a what? A break in it, such as cuts, abrasions, ulcers, or open wounds. So if a person has a, a, a kids on the skateboard and they fall, they took the skin off their elbow, I wouldn't put clay directly on that abrasion. I would put it in between a paper towel. You never put dirt in an open wound. Does that make sense? Yes. You don't do that. I would put, I could put charcoal directly in it because mm -hmm. charcoal is sterile. Mm -hmm. Sterile means there's no germs in it. Dirt, there's germs in it. 
there's a little bit of germs. This bentonite is clean bentonite clay, but it, um, it may have a little bit of bacteria in it, so I don't want to put that in an open wound. Okay, are there any questions about clay poultices? Do you think you can do one? Yeah. It's not hard. Um, the poultice that my young man here just put on was a little dry. It needed a little bit more water in it. It should be, it should be like mud that you can, like, almost like bread dough, but I'd say a little bit uh, damper than bread dough. Um, bentonite clay is expensive. I don't know if you've ever priced it. you ever priced it? Mm. This amount um, sells for about $15. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Of course, I do have some bottles here for $12. You can see me after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, everybody should have charcoal, bentonite, pine pitch. There's some things that should be in every home in case of emergency. Potatoes with a grater. Um, and if you don't have anything but potatoes, potatoes are fine. All right, let's move on to the next, next two things. And um, I need a female volunteer since we had men last time. All right, there's one. All right, come on up. And we're going to go to our um, next little second. You can stand behind the desk right there. There it is right there. Never put the clay correctly in. Skin that has a break in it. All right, so we're going to go to our cherry juice demo. Another powerful thing you can do for chronic inflammation is to drink. What kind of cherry juice does it say on the screen? Tart. How many of you have never had tart cherry juice? You've never had it before? All of you have had it before? I don't know. How many of you have never had it before? I, I can't remember if I had it. I don't remember. Put those out. This is what I'm just about. The taste. All right, let's go on. When it says tart, it means tart. It is not sweet at all. Don't be thinking like cherry soda. No, it is not no cherry soda. Matter of fact, when you taste it, it's going to be like, ah, it's bitter. But that's what you need to fight inflammation. There are chemicals in tart cherries that are, it's just like magic but not magic, really. It's God's wonderful chemicals. Anthrocyanidins are what give the cherry that red color. It's what gives the blueberries their dark blue color. And that pigment that God put in the cherry is one of the most powerful uh, antioxidants. It tamps down inflammation. And so if you have arthritis, if you have an inflamed shoulder joint, you have pain anywhere, you should be drinking cherry juice before you go to bed. And if it's too tart for you, put it in some lemonade. Amen? Sweeten it up. If you don't have lemonade, just put a little honey in it or something. But you need to get it down. And drink it before you go to bed. Drink it when you get up in the morning. And drink it in the middle of the day at least three times a day over a period of several days. And it will work to tamp down the inflammation. So I'd like everybody just to stand up. You're going to come to the front. And you're going to take... I'd like you to drink all of the cherry juice in your cup, don't leave any in the cup, and then drop your empty cup in this bucket. No honey. There's no honey in it. No, people, they all have to go step up, take one and keep going. She's going to wait. <laughs> it is, but I got it's not hard at all. Part of it has to do with just your attitude. You know, you take medicine, you just have to say, I gotta get this down. That's not that bad. Come on, 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 come on,
Ok, mi <laughs> A tart cher cherry juice from different manufacturers, some of it is more bitter yes, than others. Yes, it is. That actually wasn't that bitter. No, not if at you all. buy it at Trader Joe's, it's bitter. Yep. As I think it's better quality. I think the Walmart brand has a little bit of water added to it. <laughs> but um, that's why they can sell it a little bit too. All right. Um, our time has gotten away from us, and so, oh, somebody finished it. Um, I'll uh, be lifting me later. On. <laughs> uh, so we're not going to actually do our second, our third uh, anti-inflammatory um, procedure, but I have all the things to do it here. And um, after the meeting is out, I'll make some. If somebody would like to try it, I'll make it real quick, and we can do it. But it's called what? And it's actually on the back of your sheet there, where it has the full name. What did it say on the back of your sheet? It says what? Golden anti-inflammatory milk. milk. Or you could call it turmeric milk. Back it up, golden milk. And um, you have the recipe on the back of your sheet. And um, turmeric, it's our, our turmeric. Its um, botanical name is Cucurma longa. And this is probably the, one of the most studied plants besides garlic in the scientific community. The Chinese have been using it for thousands of years. They've been using it in India and Africa for thousands of years. And scientists finally woke up to it and said, all right, we'll study it. And when they studied it, they found it's like a cure-all. It is powerful. The reason why science doesn't get behind plants is because they can't figure out how they can charge people hundreds of dollars for something they can grow in their backyard. They can't figure that out. So they don't push it because they're not going to make money on it. That's why they're not pushing plants. They're not going to tell you about golden seal and red clover. They're not going to tell you about that even if it works. 
because they can't sell it to you because you can grow it in your backyard. You can grow it on your, on your deck. If you're in an apartment complex, you should have herbs growing on your deck. You should have tomatoes growing in your, on your little deck behind your apartment. You can grow a lot of things. And turmeric, they know that it's good for, I'm going to read this for you, antifungal, anti-anxiety. That's mind-blowing. Anti-cancer, antibacterial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. That's why we're recommending it. Antioxidant, same thing. And it modulates the immune system. Here's your formula. Here's your recipe on the back of your sheet. I'm just going to explain it really quickly. You can make it. You should make it in, if you have an inflammatory, if you have arthritis, and you need to be drinking turmeric all day long, you need to make how much of it? Four cups. Four cups is 32 ounces. That's one quart. That's this much. You should make this much minimum because you need to drink a cup, eight ounces, four times in the day. So this formula is for someone that's going to make a one quart and drink it four times in the day. So you can use four cups of soy milk, coconut milk, almond milk, any kind of nut milk, cashew milk. It could be oat milk. Um, and by the way, oat milk is a wonderful thing. It's the cheapest milk you can make. You just make oatmeal, you add water to it, put it in the blender with some vanilla and some sugar, voila, you have oat milk. And it tastes wonderful. And that's what they do in Mexico all the time. They don't use soy milk and um, they use oat milk because it's inexpensive and it's creamy, just like milk. You add to that two, what's the capital T mean? Tablespoons of what? When you open up your coconut milk, on the top, there will be a quarter inch of thick cream. You can take that off and take two tablespoons of it and put it into your, in your soy milk. And I'll tell you a little trick. You, if you do that, you'll have to heat it. That, that, that coconut cream will not blend up. It'll sit on the top. So you'll have to put it in a pot, put it on the stove. You don't want to do that. Just scoop that off and pour the coconut milk in. Just, you know, an ounce or two of coconut milk. It's liquidy, it's white, looks like cow's milk. Pour that in, it will do the same thing. Um, add two tablespoons of maple syrup or honey, two teaspoons of vanilla, four teaspoons, that's measuring teaspoon, level teaspoons of turmeric powder, a teaspoon of ginger, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. This is a recipe, it is an Recipes are not science, it's an art. You can adjust it a little bit. You might want a little bit more cinnamon or a little bit more ginger. Okay, you might want to add an extra teaspoon of turmeric. But you blend it all up um, in here and it has a sweet cinnamon taste. It's pleasant. It's not eggnog. Don't, I'm not going to go that far. But it doesn't taste bad. You can get it down. Kids will drink it. They won't make a face. And it's powerful. It really is. So that ends our simple natural remedies lecture. Are there questions? Got to have some questions for me, or I'm going to have questions for you. Can uh -oh. you go back to the show me that graphic just before the recipe, please? This one here? Yes, thank you. All right. All you have to do is just Google um, a medicinal action of turmeric, and it'll just bring up endless information. There's hundreds and hundreds of, of studies on it. Let's go here, then here, then there. Yes, it would. It would. Um, but I would also do something topically for arthritis also. You want to work from the inside and the outside. And I would go to the root of what's causing arthritis, which is the, um, the inflammation, the inflammatory diet. You know, people have gout and arthritis because they're eating wrong. And so you don't want to put a Band-Aid on a broken leg. You want to get to the root. You want to change those habits. Yes, let's go, let's go here. We'll come to you. All right, so I heard that turmeric, if you place it on your skin, is it good for cancer on skin too? Or are you just indigest it in your body and put it also on the outside? Yes, I would do both inside and outside. And there's many other things you can do for cancer for the outside also. But yes, it's anti-cancer, <laughs> whether it's, you take it orally and you would also put it externally. 
Gerald, and then over here. Is there some tumor better than others uh, in terms of the quality or the maker, uh, where they get it from? Or? Um, I don't know anything about that. I just, I, when he gets it from, um, you know, her, her herbal suppliers, and I think it's all kind of like standard. It is bright yellow, and they use turmeric to color soaps and food. It's like a dye. It has so much color in it. Over here. Okay, well, I wanted to ask, uh, okay, what if it was to have degenerative arthritis with their bones are being ate away? Like osteoarthritis, where it's just wearing out the bones. Okay, so that's not, this is not going to reverse osteoarthritis, you know. Um, this is for like rheumatoid arthritis where you have inflammation in the joint. But if you've worn bone and you've worn, worn your cartilage out, you need a knee replacement is what you need, or a miracle. Well, because, um, because what has happened is beyond what turmeric can do. We can damage our body so far where we've got to have heroic intervention. You understand what I'm saying? I had a neighbor that um, he has lots of health problems. And I asked him, uh, hey, um, do you mind if, I had seen he had health problems for a long time and one day I was at his house and he collapsed on his deck and broke a glass table. And I said, hey, Jim, you having a tough day there, brother? I, hey, I didn't tell you this, but I actually work with people on health. You want me to, you want to, would that to go walking? He said, yes, I would. And I said, I'll walk with you every day. And I walked with him for, for 18 months, and he lost 35 pounds. He changed his diet, and he was doing really, really well. Then his knees, he's in his 70s, his knees started going out, he had to have a knee replacement, stopped walking, and then his other knee went out, he had to have a second oh, knee replacement. Yes. So he needed, not turmeric, he needed osteosurgery. <laughs> and now he's good, he's walking again. But, um, but he had damaged his knees over a long period of time. Question here. Um, what if he have uh, turmeric oil? Turmeric oil is good. I have inflammation in my shoulder before I go to bed when he puts turmeric oil in castor oil as a carrier. Rubs it in my shoulder trying to fight the inflammation in my shoulder. Yes. Question over here. That was my question. What do you use topically for the arthritis? Um, you can use turmeric oil. It's essential oil of turmeric. It's very strong. It has, a, it has much more scent than the powder. And you would, put, you would just put a few drops in castor oil. Castor oil is the carrier. Castor oil will carry any essential oil deeper into the body. Okay, we're going to have to go because we have a, I want to get you out close to our quitting time. Let's take a two minute break. Before we do, everybody stand up. We're going to do an exercise we did last night. I want you to Roll your shoulders out and your shoulder blades together. Your thumbs are out and your arms are down. And your chin is up. Stretch a little bit. Here, relax. Shake it off. Let's do it again. Shoulders out, chin up, shoulder blades together. This is called retract and depress. Retract and depress. Chin up, stretch. All right, take a, take a two minute break, come back in two minutes, and we're gonna go. Sorry to announce our break is over. I <laughs> laugh like it was a joke or something. I got a quick question just yes, to get started. Because I have osteo in. Um, Rheumatoid uh, okay. arthritis. Okay. Is this something you guys work on? You, you and Lindy? Or? Uh, yeah, we can do a health consultation. Okay. And I mean, all right. God is the healer, so we yeah. just try natural things and yeah. I mean, I pray tried, and see. I've done all this stuff, you know. Yeah. And it just seems like I would just keep trying, keep trying different things until you find something that I works. Do. I do. Yeah. Very strict yeah. diet. And lots of anti-inflammatory foods. Yeah, because they took. I would do juice fasting just to. I do that too. Yeah. I do that too. Because um, if you have osteo and rheumatoid, it's horrible. It's just yeah, and it can disfigure. Oh my uh, goodness. I, I, I've seen horrific things. You gotta fight that every day. You gotta fight that every day. That's all right. Okay. Thank all right. You. It is um five minutes to eight. I was supposed to end at eight thirty. I got solid 45 minutes. So what do you want me to do? Do you want me just to speed on through? 
or you want me to end and just cut off the arm at the end? <laughs> It'd be ugly, but it'll be finished. <laughs> All right, so it's whatever you want. Now I'll just try to. <coughs> there's a there's a, a two-edged sword to go fast. Sometimes it's better not to go fast. Yes. yes. If I go fast, I think that it's just like. But this is important. This is important. You ready? Yes. Then we have a word of prayer. Bow your heads, Father in heaven. We thank you so much for bringing us into this room this at this time. If we don't have high blood pressure ourselves, we know of people that have it and you want us to help them. Teach us now and put a love in our hearts for other people. Sebastian, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is called a wellness seminar. And in order for it to be a wellness seminar, the people that attend have to make some changes. Yes. And if you make a change every night that you come, by the end of the seminar, you've made several changes. Mm -hmm. And you're on the road to wellness. If you just come and attend and say, oh, that was some wonderful slides, that was interesting, and you don't make any changes, it's a health seminar, not a wellness seminar. To be a wellness seminar, you have to look your own life squarely in the face and say, I gotta make some changes. I'm asking everybody to try to do a little bit of walking every day, even if it's just 10 minutes. How many people are walking 10 minutes a day at least? Okay, excellent. Keep doing it <coughs> by Wednesday. How many of you are drinking at least two quarts of water a day? That's pretty good. Keep doing that. How many of you are eating 50% of your meals are fresh fruits and vegetables? Not as many hands for that. Oh, we got a part of hands for that. Raw? It doesn't have to be raw, it can be cooked. Foods and vegetables. That's anti inflammatory. That's outstanding. All right. So let's go. The title of our message is Eliminating High Blood Pressure Naturally. Trying to understand the rationale and the science of it. The media has us looking for the next Omicron variant. BA4, BA5 is coming, we've got a surge. And they're still saying that this is the biggest problem that we're facing. But do you know how many people died of COVID since it was found in December of 2019? Take a guess, how many people around the whole world have died? I'll tell you, that's a very hard thing to guess. There's the answer, what's the answer? Six point, that's a terrible thing for six, million three hundred fifty seven thirty seven thousand people to have died that is a terrible thing but there's something far more terrible than that hypertension high blood pressure kills nine million people every year so since 2019 that was three years ago it has killed how many people in three years at least 27 million that's almost four times, over four times as much as COVID, and nobody's talking about hypertension. Why is that? One estimate shows that it kills 10.7 million people per day. I'm just showing you different statistics. So hypertension is killing a lot of people. And the reason that it's killing more people than all other conditions and infectious diseases combined together. 10.7 million deaths per year. When COVID was at its height, when it was killing the most people in America, that was in 2020, it was way down. Almost twice the number died that year of heart disease, a um, little less than twice died of cancer, and heart disease and cancer are the two biggest killers and those are lifestyle diseases. If you change the way you live, you will not die of heart disease or cancer. And so, um, unless just in the rarest situation, so the biggest threat to Americans is not COVID, it's heart disease. Last year, an article came out. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it says that there was zero media coverage. And then it says it in capital letters, zero. And what was the article? It said that the world's leading killer 
was just mowing people down. And what was it? It's high blood pressure. And high blood pressure can be what? Prevented. It can be prevented or treated with low cost medicine. Only one in seven people that have hypertension are actually have it under control. Most people that have it, it's just running wild and it's going to take them out. We've gone in these communities right around here and take the high blood pressure and every day we go, we come across people, their blood pressure is way out there. And people aren't managing it. It's just out of control. And um, one in three Americans have it, 78 million. It's actually about more, closer to one in four. And 20% of the people that have it don't even know that they have it. I was in um, um, Alabama, and I was taking blood pressures from door to door, and I came to a door, and there were five young black guys. I don't think any of them was over 22 years old. And I said, can I take your blood pressure? He said, no. Can I take yours? No. Can I take yours? No. Can I take yours? Yeah. Cool. Put the blood pressure on him. Took his blood pressure. It was like 200 over 100. I said, young man, how old are you? I'm 19. I said, you better go to the doctor and get on some pills right away. Other brothers said, hey, hey, take mine too. Take mine. I was taking all their blood pressure now. Half of them, these guys were not even 21. Their blood pressure was way up there because they're just eating garbage all day long, sitting on the porch, cussing and listening to rap music. And, they're, and, and you think that that makes them a little bit lower blood pressure? <laughs> it wasn't lowering their blood pressure at all. You see down here in the southern states, it's particularly bad. What is blood pressure? It's the measurement of the blood's force against the blood vessel wall. And it goes up and down. When the heart beats, it goes higher. That's the systolic number. In between beats, the pressure goes down. That's the diastolic number. And it's measured in millimeters of mercury. Each time your heart beats, the pressure goes a little bit more. And in between beats, the heart rate falls. And as you get older, your, sorry sister, as you get older, your blood pressure goes up. It increases as you age, okay? Usually by 15 points by the time you get to age 55. 60% of people that are at age 65 and older have high blood pressure. I went to have my blood pressure tested at the doctor's and the last three times, it was 150 over 90. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm getting high blood pressure. Mm. And I, I told the doctor, I said, I need to have my blood pressure. She said, you don't have, she says, you're, you're almost 65. You're doing good. I'm like, mm -mm, I don't accept that. <laughs> and uh, she said, take it every morning. And I did, and I didn't. It was just that I was getting stressed when I went to the, to the doctor. Mm -hmm. I don't have high blood pressure. Does blood pressure have to rise as you age? No. Does it have to go up? No. no, it doesn't. How do we know? Because in Kenya, they have Maasai people, and their blood pressure, um, they walk a lot, they eat whole grain food, they eat very low salt in their diet, and um, at age 40, their blood pressure is 125 over 80. And what's really interesting is that 20 years later, by the time they're 60, not only their blood pressure not go up, their blood pressure actually goes down. It improves to 110 over 70 because the way that they live is driving blood pressure down. They walk a lot, they eat whole foods, they eat little salt, and so just living their life from 40 to 60, their blood pressure keeps getting lower and lower and lower. So this whole business that you get older, you have to have high blood pressure, don't believe it. It doesn't have to happen, and they know that it doesn't have to happen. That's in the book, How Not to Die by Michael Gregor, excellent book. What's interesting is that the scientists, if you ask them, well, what causes high blood pressure? They'll tell you, nobody knows. Here it is, right there on the screen. It says, no definitive causes. Brothers and sisters, that is a lie. I don't know why they're saying that. They know what causes it. I'm going to show you right here. And this is what the science shows. The science shows what causes it. There's two types, there's secondary and there's primary. That means that you don't have a disease that gives you high blood pressure. And they, what they say, we don't have any causes, but there's risk factors. Okay, so what causes it? It's your lifestyle. You're, you're breaking the laws of health, and so it causes your blood vessels to get stiff and your heart is straining. 
And if you live in harmony with God's natural laws, your blood pressure will go down. The roots of the great tree of disease are poor habits, poor diet, lack of exercise, breathing polluted air, you're angry and bitter, you don't go to bed, you don't drink your water, you eat a bunch of garbage and junk, and the net effect of that, what happens is you don't reap it right away, you don't reap it until you're much older. The reaping years are 50s and 60s. What are the reaping years? When you're 25 years old, you're 19 years old, you eat that big Snickers bar, you know, chase that with the, uh, with the icy cherry Coke and then have the burger, what you say is, it won't hurt me. That's, that's what I said. And you just keep saying that and you keep doing that for 20 years and the reaping years are the what? 50s and 60s. And you'll find that you have a whole constellation of health problems. You'll say, well, why did this happen to me? It's because you've been sowing the seeds of disobedience and now you're reaping the harvest of disease. The Bible says, though a sinner do evil, how often? Though a sinner do evil a hundred times in his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, but it shall not be well with the wicked. It says that you're going to reap. You can do it a hundred times, but you reap later. If you go plant corn in the ground today, you can't come back tomorrow and try to get corn. You got to wait. Yes. And 70 days later, there's something like this. And that's what happens with our lifestyle. What are the risk factors associated with hypertension? Here they are according to science. Being overweight, being stressed, getting older, that's not true. You don't have to be. Genetics, if your father had high blood pressure, your grandfather had it, you're more likely to have it. Alcohol drives it up, caffeine. This is the primary reason right here. Mm. If you don't get anything out of this lecture, just catch this one thing, you've got to cut the salt. Salt is a bad thing. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna spend any time on this. There are three different factors in high blood pressure. And um, you have a lot of blood, the pressure goes up. When your heart pumps, the pressure goes up. If there's more resistance for the blood to flow, the pressure goes up. And there's one other factor. If your body doesn't move the blood around well, your pressure will go up. I don't know if you know it or not, that your brain can tell your blood where to flow. It can actually direct it through hormones. It directs where the blood goes. When you eat a meal, the body reduces the blood to the legs and arms and sends more blood to the digestive system because that's where it's needed. When you got, start running, the body diverts blood from the digestive system to the legs, because that's where it's needed. And the body actually moves blood around. And that also affects um, blood pressure. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The number one thing that drives it up is the, ar the arteries getting, the walls of the arteries getting thicker. The, the, di the diameter of the walls get thicker, so the hole in the middle is smaller. So here's a normal blood vessel, the blood, but here's where the wall is real thick and the hole is small. And so that, that's called atherosclerosis. It's called what? Atherosclerosis. Or the simple term is heart disease. When your blood vessels get all fat and there's a little hole in the middle, that's called heart disease. It can be anywhere in your body, not just in your heart. It can be in your arms, your feet, your legs, your carotid artery. And that is because of eating too much cholesterol. And what happens is that cholesterol builds up in the, in the side of your blood vessel. Do you see that? This is a normal vessel. But after years of going to McDonald's and um, Burger King and eating a bunch of chili cheese fries, then it starts building up in your blood vessel. And I want you to notice that there's little white dots there. That's calcium that after it builds up to a certain amount, the body starts putting calcium in the lining of the blood vessels. And so the opening gets what? And the walls get what? They get stiffer. So your heart beats and then the blood vessel doesn't stretch like it's okay. It has calcium in it and the pressure stays high. And that's a bad thing. It's leading to a catastrophic event that happens in your 50s and 60s. But a lot of that damage is now happening earlier. 
So if this is time elapsed over 30 years of bad habits, boom, your blood vessels close just like that. After 30 years of eating bad, they get narrower and narrower. The reason why blood pressure kills so many people is because it leads to complications. And they count all of those complications as a result of blood pressure. That's, why they, that's how they can get 9, 10 million a year. It leads to stroke. It leads to blindness. It leads to heart attacks. It leads to kidney disease, sexual dysfunction. It leads to mental problems. And it leads to heart failure. We'll talk about a couple of those. So hypertension is a crook. It's a criminal, but it has accomplices. They, they got guys in the back seat, and those guys are killers. So even if the hypertension doesn't get you, his boys are going to get you. So you people that talk, oh, my blood pressure is 140 over I'm cool, I'm straight. I don't need no stuff. That's what you're saying, but it's these guys back here that are going to come for you, and they're not messing around. They're going to take you out. And that's why it used to only kill 600 million people, and now, in 2008, huge numbers, because it contributes to aneurysms, heart failure, kick, stroke, all those other things are coming in. Perhaps the most devastating thing hypertension does is it weakens your heart. Now just think about this for a minute. Your heart is pumping day and night, and you're making it pump against some really hard pressure. It's having to pump, and it's hard to push the blood. And the heart does that for year after year. You know what happens? The heart gets tired, and the heart weakens and that's called congestive heart failure. It's that the heart has just worn out. And it either has, um, if it, it's a systolic problem, I'm gonna show you a picture, the walls get really thick, or if it's a diastolic problem, that's when it's in between beats. And if it's a systolic problem, the, the heart walls get really thin, doesn't matter. Either way, the heart becomes weak. And so it can't push as much blood. And that's a bad thing. Because you need blood to move in yes. your body. You don't need blood to pool. And um, what happens when you put the first sign of it is that you see the ankles start to swell. And that's because the heart doesn't have enough force to pump the fluid back up. And so it just pools at the ankles. And then they start to, it says cyanotic, they turn blue. And I had a gentleman, he came to our house, he had high blood pressure, and I was giving him a massage, and when he took his pants off and I looked at his ankles, his ankles were black. And I said, bro, look at your ankles. He said, yes, I know. I said, do you know what's going on here? He said, yeah, the doctor said I'm headed for amputation. I'm like, bro, you don't want to be in a wheelchair. You don't. You need to do so. I, I was in shock, and he was just matter of fact. Well, this, this is what it is. His ankles were blue. And what happens is the heart is getting weak, and so the fluid pulls in the ankles. And as it continues to get weak, the fluid builds up where? Around the lungs. And they can't breathe. That's the result. That's called congestive heart failure. Look at the normal foot. They have mild edema, swelling. They have moderate. And it eventually becomes what they call pitting edema. You can push your finger in it and it won't come back. It's just that your finger impression is there. I was at a church and I gave a lecture in California. And the gentleman um, that had invited me, he said, I'm going to tell you about what happened. I was giving a health talk at the church and one of the brothers said, I got a, a lot of swelling. Can you come counsel me? So they went in the pastor's study and he said, can I see your swelling? And he said, the gentleman took his pants down and he says his legs were swollen from his ankles up to his mid thigh. Mm -hmm. He had fluid swollen all up through his knees. And he told him, he said, brother, your, your heart is failing. You're having lots of trouble. And this is what he said. He said, have you made everything right with God and your family? He said, no, I haven't. He said, you need to go make things right today. Let's get on the floor. Let's kneel right now. And they prayed. And he said, call your son that you're estranged with. 72 hours later, he was dead. He dropped dead. Wow. And I told my brother, I said, I shook his hand. I said, you did the right thing. You saw, if you have fluid all the way up to here, your heart is about, your heart is about to give out. And when we see swelling in people's ankles, when we see people with swollen ankles, we should go talk to them. There's something going on there. It might not be congestive heart failure, but ankles are not supposed to be fat. That's 
You hear what I said? Yes. When you see fat ankles, something is wrong. And you have to have tact, love, courtesy, and courage to say, my sister, can we go for a walk? So I can talk and uh, walk and talk with you. Damage the uh, uh, um, high blood pressure, it weakens the marrow, destroys the brain, and it really is devastating for the what? Kidneys. For the kidneys. Why is that so? When you have fluid and you're pushing it through a filter, if the fluid is at high pressure, it blows holes in the filter. And it'll eventually take the filter out. And if you have high blood pressure for 30 years, you're going to end up with damaged kidneys. When you were born, each of your kidneys had one million filtering units called nephrons. And um, but as you age, those nephrons get destroyed. Just, just life just wears them out. And it's fine because you have lots of filtering capacity, except if you have kidney disease. Then your, your kidney capacity goes way down, and then you have some difficulty. Here's, here's, here's the, um, the glomeruli count. As you age, as you're, by the time you, from 20 to 40, you've lost 25% of your capacity. By 60, you've lost 50% of your capacity. By the time you get to 80, you know, you're operating with 75 percent of your kidney function gone. But still, you still have enough function to make it if you don't have kidney disease. So high blood pressure just accelerates that and it just takes the kidneys out. Brothers and sisters, you need your kidneys. You don't need them to fail. That's a bad thing. You don't want to go on dialysis. And this is what happens. The kidneys get destroyed by that high pressure and you end up on hemodialysis, and there's all kinds of complications from that. Um, side infection, <coughs> muscle cramps, blood clots. The most common is what? Depression. Depression. You go on that machine, you're going to, most people get extremely depressed. You've got to hook up to it three times a week, and it's slavery, actually. And this thing, brothers and sisters, your heart filters your blood every minute. You hear what I said? Your heart, pumping the blood through your kidneys, it filters your blood sometimes five times <coughs> per minute. That's almost every 12 seconds. Imagine you getting your blood cleaned three times a week. What does that mean? That means that you're extremely toxic. You have a lot of toxins because your blood's only being cleaned. It was cleaned every minute. Before, now it's only being cleaned three times a week. You'll have all kinds of health problems. You'll shorten your life from five to seven years going on those machines. My father-in-law was on kidney dialysis, and he died at age 67. He should not have been dead. The other thing is that high blood pressure results in? It will blow a blood vessel in your brain. And a ruptured blood vessel, you don't want this. This is a bad thing, and it will kill you. It killed my father. My father died on a Sabbath morning. He was in the bed talking to my mother. And it was early on a Sabbath morning. And he was talking to her. He just said, oh. and she said, Skeet, you OK? She, she was pushing him and pushed him out of the bed. Mm. And he did not respond. She called 911. And they came. He said, he has a pulse. My mother got in the ambulance. He was dead before he got to the hospital. And my sister called me. She said, Johnny, if you're standing up, sit down. Dad is dead. Boom, just like that. That's what happened to him. Aneurysm in his head burst. You don't want that. My, my father had high blood pressure for 30 years. He wouldn't take his pills. He didn't want to walk. He didn't want to change his diet. He was overweight. And it shortened his life. He died at 63 years of age. He could have lived to 83. And I dedicated myself to try to warn people, don't go down that path. You can make a change. And if you're young, now is the time to make that change. Let's talk about the natural program to reduce hypertension. Where should the ax be laid? At the green roof. Of the tree. Turning off the faucet versus mopping the floor. Going to the doctor is like mopping the floor. The faucet's running and they just want to give you pills to treat it. But the best thing to do is to turn off the source of the problem. How do you do that? You've got to stop the disease producing lifestyle. <coughs> the Bible says that the curse causeless shall not come. There's a cause, there's a reason why you have this curse. So you've got to get to that cause and remove it. That's what it says, Ministry of Healing, we need to remove the cause.
these is trying to correct them. What is the program? Are you ready for the answer? Drum roll. What should we do if we want to get rid of high blood pressure? Are you ready for it? Yes. It's, what if it's bad news? You want to hear it? You want to hear it? Yes. Want me to tell you the truth? Yes. All right. Here's the truth. First step. You have to have 30 minutes of aerobic exercise every day. How much did I say? 30 minutes is necessary to arrest and reverse chronic degenerative disease. Cancer, arthritis, high blood pressure, heart disease. You need a minimum of 30 minutes a day. If you want rapid reversal, you need 60 minutes a day. So don't start out 60 minutes. Just start out trying to walk 10 or 15 minutes and build yourself up. And you want to build up to how much? A minimum of 30, but ideally how much? 60, 60 minutes. And it's, you can do it. You might have to do it 15 minutes at a time. If you walk 60 minutes a day, it'll change everything in your body. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will lay the foundation for every change. Yes, ma'am? Does it need to be consecutive? It can be 15 minutes four times a day. It can be 10 minutes six times a day. You just got to get 60 minutes in. But people find it hard to do. And it's because it's hard starting out. But once you establish the habit, this is the foundation if you want to get rid of all chronic diseases. What else do you have to do? High potassium diet, if you can tolerate potassium. OK, so what is that? Fruits and vegetables. And it has to also be, what does it say here? Low sodium. Low sodium. If you don't get high potassium, the most important thing is to be low <laughs> sodium. You've got to cut the salt. Got to do what? Cut, cut, cut the salt. salt. Cut the salt. Herbal therapy. There's certain herbs that you can take. Yes, ma'am. Don't we eat some salt? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. How much? As little as 50 milligrams a day. The average person eats 5,000 milligrams a day. That's terrible. So we can... You cannot avoid salt. If you're eating anything at all, anything. you're getting salt. Yeah. There's salt in potato. Yeah. There's salt in avocado. There's salt in apple. There's salt in every piece of food you eat. There's a little bit of salt. Mm -hmm. The problem is not that we're not getting enough salt. The problem is we're getting way too much salt. <laughs> but we do need salt. Yeah. But you can't avoid it. It's just like protein. A person on a strict Plant-based diet will not be protein deficient because there's protein in everything. Yeah. There's protein in lettuce. There's protein in yes over here. Yeah, other than bananas, what's some good potassium? We'll put it on screen in just a minute. Your melons are very high. Cantaloupe. There's 20 things that are higher than than, than bananas. Yes. So can you eat too many? Because tomatoes are very salty. Can you eat too much tomatoes? Um. That's you can't eat too much of anything. Well, yeah. Yeah, but um, you'd have to eat a whole lot before I'd say you ate too much. Because tomatoes are also high in potassium. Mm -hmm. So what did I say? There's a ratio here. Mm -hmm. right. We're going to come to the ratio in just a moment. Herbs, there are certain plants. Hibiscus, we call it um, sorrel. Sorrel. Sorrel in Jamaica. That's sorrel. hibiscus tea. That is extremely good for high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Now drink our water, Russian steam bath. If you're eating salt, get in the hot tub and just sweat for 15 minutes. You'll sweat out a lot of salt. Mm -hmm. So you can actually undo the damage. If you're busting up some Dorito chips, get in the steam bath. <laughs> <laughs> sweat that stuff out. And that will undo some of the damage. Some. Right thinking, we'll talk about that. And devotional reforms, you gotta get prayed up. To change your habits, you gotta pray. If you ain't praying, the devil is going to overcome you. Oh, yeah. You don't have the willpower to change your habits on your own. If you're over 40 years of age, you're going to find it's a hard thing to change your habits. Hey, if you're over 20 years of age, you're going to find it's a hard thing to change your habits. So let's talk a little bit about those things and then we'll close. We're doing really good. In the constellation of high blood pressure, there are planets that revolve with it. It's not there by itself, just the sun by itself. There's a whole lot of things that go with it. And stress. Stressful lifestyle. This is the big one. Excess of salt. Not walking. Not doing any exercise. Taking caffeine. High cholesterol diet. Don't eat your vegetables. A bunch of sugar. All of those things are part of the, the big solar system of high blood pressure, and you got to address them. This is the big one. 
And I love salt. I'm a salt addict. I was eating sunflower seeds when I was a kid. I eat the chips. If I don't have chips in two days, I, I'm starting to get shaky. My wife's like, what, 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 I need some chips. I get about to bed at two in the morning, like, busting up some chips. And, that's a problem for me. And that's why my blood pressure is starting to do like this. You got to fight against it. Here it is. Sister said, how much salt do you need? We need as little as how much? Sodium per day. Western diet consumes how much? 5,000. How much is 5,000 over 50? How many percent? That's a hundred times more than what you need. 50 times 10 is 500. It says we're eating 5,000. And I'm talking about the vegans now. I'm not talking about the media. I'm coming to I'm coming for you. Yes, yes sister. So we need less than a teaspoon Oh, much less than a teaspoon. A teaspoon's like fifteen hundred. We need as little as fifty. You you can't you can't get um too little salt. You're gonna get plenty. Let's move on. I don't know if you know this or not, that, that white eye dye salt is not good for you. You need to eat natural salt. But the natural salt is not all the same. Exactly. E and sea salt is 330 milligrams per quarter teaspoon. Pink Himalayan salt is 420 milligrams per quarter teaspoon. I dye sea salt is how much? Per quarter teaspoon. So there, you're getting, you're putting salt on your food, but you better check to see how salty your salt is. So which one of these salts should you probably buy? Sea salt. Here it is, eating sea salt. Okay, I got all three of those in my can. I got about five different kinds of salt. And I'm talking about why we gotta, we gotta cut that back. But that's not where your salt is coming from. It's coming from hidden sources. 71% of all the salt you eat is coming from processed food. So if you want to get, only 5% comes from you shaking it. If you shake a little bit of salt on your grits, that's not what's hurting you. Go ahead, shake a little salt on your grits. That's not what's hurting you. Only 5% of your salt comes to the table. It's coming from eating things that come in packages. It's cellophane, canned. It's, it's coming up plastic. And you're buying this off the shelf. In that food, there's hidden Salt. So we have to eliminate foods that are high in salt. And here's just a few of them. Breakfast cereals. I don't know if you've ever looked at the ingredients. Breakfast cereals are through the roof with salt. Breads. Do you know that the average slice of bread, one slice, has 150 milligrams? That's the healthy bread. One slice. So if you eat three slices of bread with jelly, you are already at 450. <laughs> Man, you, you way over the 50 milligrams. And this soups and pizza, this pizza super hot, french fries. Woo, there it is. Let's go to McDonald's for a moment. Just a regular hamburger, 500 milligrams. What's this all called over here? What's that called? Big Mac. Yeah, like you've never seen that before. I know you've seen it. What is that called? It's a Big Mac. Big Mac. And how much, how much does it have? A whopping 1,000 milligrams. Here's a double Big Mac. Now, this is a nice slide here. It says, which is healthier? Double Big Mac or Caesar salad? Caesar salad. That is incorrect. The correct answer is the double Big Mac is healthier. The Caesar salad has more calories. It has more fat. It has more sodium. Wow. It has less protein than the double Big Mac. So what happens is you go into McDonald's and say, oh, I'm going to get the Caesar salad. I'm going to do better. They got you. <laughs> got you. They messed you up because that processed food, they're putting the salt in there. They say, hey, we want them to go to the hospital later on. We're going to make money over there. What about the people that eat the vegetarian meat? Four big chicken nuggets. Bam! 300 milligrams. Now what about the morning star sausage? My favorite. Two of those. Bam! 300 milligrams. Too much salt. So why does salt raise the blood pressure? This is why. 
when you have a lot of salt in your bloodstream, the body says, got to get it out. So the body turns up the blood pressure so that it will be excreted through the kidneys. Chemically, the body elevates the blood pressure when it has salt. It says, too much salt, too much salt. I got to squeeze it out through the kidneys. So salt turns on the elevation of the blood pressure. It raises the pressure to push out extra fluid. And that is a bad thing. That's why we shouldn't be eating it. Are there any societies that are salt free? Just looking at the picture, what would you say? There must be, and they are. It's right where Venezuela meets Brazil, the Yanomami Indians. These people are the lowest salt intake people in the entire world. The scientists have found them, and they're like, what they doing down here? <laughs> they messing up our game. We want to study you. We, we're, we're fascinated. We think you're wonderful people. And they went down there and studied these Indians of South America, and they had the slowest sodium intake ever recorded. And guess what their blood pressure was? 100 over 60. And it stayed that until they died their entire life. You hear what it said? What was their blood pressure? What do they tell you is normal? They tell you 120 over 70. It should be lower. 120 over 70 is still too high. We should all be under 110. I don't care how old you are. I bet you you take Jay's blood pressure right now. It's like 90 over 60 or, or 80 over 50. And, and when he gets older at the Lord should tell it should still be under 100. And it's, it, it's not supposed to reach 120 over 70. Yes, here and then here. So the, so the recommended value according to like the packages of everything, it's like 2,400 a thing a day? That's not right, right? Yeah, what the, what the medical profession tells us is not really healthy. They'll tell you if, oh, if your cholesterol is under 200, it's low. That's not correct. They're just telling you what, as they've taken all these blood, all these cholesterols, that's what the average is. So you come in, they're like, oh, you're doing pretty good. But actually, if you're on God's plan, your cholesterol will be lower than 220. Your blood pressure will be lower than 120 over 70. It'll all be down here where it's supposed to be. And so we need to follow the Yamamani Indians in South America. A study of 20 high blood pressure patients, when they dropped it below 3,000, it dropped 19 millimeters mercury. So even if you got down to a teaspoon of salt a day, your blood pressure would start falling still. It's when you're eating five and 6,000 milligrams a day. Sorry, I keep walking up on this camera. When you're eating five or 6,000 milligrams a day, it's just way up here. Mm. If you could cut that in half, mm. it would stop, it would start dro dropping. We had two health guests came out to our health center. Her blood pressure, a sister from California, her blood pressure was 185 over 110. And in two weeks, it dropped 30 points. His blood pressure was 190 over 120. And it dropped 20 points just by putting them on low salt diet and walking an hour a day. You cannot get those kind of results with taking three different blood pressure pills. You cannot get it to drop 30 points just by cutting the sodium and and forcing them to walk an hour a day drinking water, sitting in the steam bath. It just drove that blood pressure down. She went home to California, stayed on the program. He went back to his home state, got off the program. His blood pressure went right back up where it is. I call him, pray with him all the time. I said, brother, you need to start walking. You need to stay on the program. Let me tell you something else. Different people have different tolerance to salt. Some people are what they call salt sensitive. And if they have a little bit of salt, blood pressure comes up. Other people, like me, are salt resistant. I can eat a lot of salt, my blood pressure hardly moves. It's still bad for me, I gotta get off of it. But people have different tolerances of salt. And all you have to do to determine that is take your blood pressure every night for three nights, and then take your blood pressure the next three nights by eating a big bag of salty chips before you go to bed. 
and take it in the morning. And you'll see, it'll, if it bumps up like that, you know that you are what? Oh, excuse me. Salt sensitive. That you can't tolerate it. Some people, they will get no rise. They'll eat a bunch of salt, take the blood pressure, it's still the same. They're salt resistant. But it still does damage. You shouldn't be eating a lot of salt. Okay. Your body is continually losing what? Potassium. So that indicates that God intended that you be continually eating what? Potassium. That's what it indicates. Here's the ratio. All those slides, just to get to this slide. If you got this, you go home, you learn something you never knew before. If you eat four times as much potassium as you eat salt, your blood pressure will normalize. Boom. On the cellular level. What did I say? If you eat four times as much potassium as you eat salt, if you eat 10,000, let's say 40,000 milligrams of potassium and only 10,000 milligrams of salt, that's four to one, your blood pressure will be normal. So the ratio is a factor of four. A factor of four. In plain English, eating four times as much potassium as sodium is the cure for hypertension. So what should we do? Eat more potassium and less salt and we'll get four times to one and the blood pressure starts falling. That's what we did at our health center. We just said you're going to be eating cantaloupes, watermelon, bananas. You're going to be eating all this high potassium food and we're going to cut your salt and their blood pressure just started coming down. Yes? How about the potassium supplements? You can take potassium supplements. You can buy it in Walmart. They have potassium. It's in a little tap, a little package. 500 milligrams. Throw that in your lemonade. Bam. Okay. Now you say, oh, I can eat now 100 <laughs> milligrams of sodium. Because I had 400. I mean, that's just the reality. You can have more salt if you're eating more potassium. So that's the key. I have this book. I think I have an excellent. I'll bring it here. We'll raffle it off. And then somebody, anybody here that has the highest blood pressure, I'll give this book to you. It's called the High Blood Pressure Solution. Scientifically proven. They've done hundreds and hundreds of studies. They said, man, you get your potassium way up there, boom, you've cured it. Or get your salt way down. What also raises blood pressure? Sugar. Sugar increases your blood pressure. The British Journal of Pharmacology came out with a massive study that says that sugar causes the blood vessels to constrict causes the blood vessels to, to constrict, and that raises the blood pressure. So if you're trying to get your blood pressure down, you've got to also not only cut salt, you have to cut the sugar. Yes, ma'am? Does that include maple syrup or honey? It includes all sugars, but maple syrup is better than, than other refined sugar, but it refers to all sugar. You know, we, um, just because it's maple syrup or honey, I've seen uh, homes that they homeschool their kids and the child says, like, pass the honey, mommy. <laughs> They're putting it on their cereal. <laughs> That's way too much honey. The Bible says to eat much honey is not good. That's in the book of Proverbs. So you can actually have too much of a natural sweetener. What about the monk food? <laughs> <laughs> monk food is good. That's excellent. It has fiber and it's much better than the refined. But we need to be working on getting victory over our sweet tooth, amen? amen? We need to start falling in love with food more than sweets. And a lot of people have a sweet tooth. My father was, he was a sweet tooth fanatic and it shortened his life. He just, he would, he would drink soda before he'd drink water and that was his thing and it, it hurt him. Here's the study. Sugar could be worse for your blood pressure than salt. They did a study with 8,600 French adults, and they found that sugar just caused their heart rate to quicken because the blood vessels constricted. Cholesterol, if you're eating animal products, dairy, beef, chicken, fish, milk, um, ice cream, those things are high in cholesterol. Your body needs cholesterol. It forms, the, it forms the part of the membrane of every cell in your body. Your body does need it, but your body produces all the cholesterol it needs. It's produced in the liver. 
and the liver produces all you need and it goes into your bloodstream. And if you take cholesterol from your food, then you end up with too much cholesterol in the bloodstream. Why is that? Because the cholesterol molecule is a very complicated molecule. That's it on the screen. That's the chemical um, signature for it. See this molecule here? That's very complicated. It's so complicated that your body has almost, what does it say here? No capacity, no capacity to digest it. It cannot, it can only get digest 2% of it. So if your body, your liver is producing enough that you need, and then you start eating it, the body says, oh, what do I do? I can't break this liver, I can't break it down. So it says, okay, dump it in the bloodstream then. And it just dumps it in the bloodstream. That's a bad thing. Because it gets into the lining of your blood vessels, and your blood vessels start doing this. They start swelling. Oh, man. Got to go. Got to go. Got to finish that. So, you develop, what's it, what's it called? Atherosclerosis. That's the clogging of your artery. That's what they look when you were 10 years old. That's what they look when you're 20. When you get to my age, they look like this. When you get to, to 70, you have almost no place for the, for the blood to go. And this is the catch. This is the most important thing I want you to get on this slide. There's no symptoms until you get to this. No symptoms. You don't feel any pain. You're running, you're walking, you're talking, you feel fine. And the 50% of the symptom, the first symptom, is a heart attack. And it happens in the morning before you've eaten breakfast. That's where 90% of them happen. You get up in the morning, you're going about doing what you're doing, and oh, 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 oh. Yes, you should not do any exercise, none of us, before you've had some milk, some sugar, something in your system. Because when there's nothing in your system, your blood platelets are, are, are stickier and you're more likely to have a heart attack. So it's called a silent killer because you don't have any symptoms until it's too late. Until it gets like this, that's an actual blood vessel, a picture, a cross section. You don't want blood vessels like that. And how you get them is you say, hey, it's not going to hurt me. I'll be good. I'll be great. And you do that for 20 years and it comes back. You, to avoid full time cholesterol, you have to avoid oil. Not just fat things from animals. But even vegetable oil will trigger your body to make more cholesterol than it needs. So people that have high cholesterol, and I know of some vegans that have high cholesterol, they have to also cut their vegetable oil. They can't be using a lot of olive oil and stuff. And, and butter and margarine are the worst for you to use. Margarine is worse than butter. If you have to have something unless you get the plant-based butter and use that in moderation. Exercise boosts the good cholesterol, and um, the good cholesterol is cholesterol that stays in the bloodstream, doesn't go in the blood vessel wall. So, um, so if you exercise, your body will produce more cholesterol that just flushes out through the colon. If you don't exercise, the body makes a um, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, which tends to clog the blood vessels. So, so exercise actually changes the way which cholesterol your body makes. All right, I'm not going to go through that. It's getting too complicated. Here's a wonderful slide here, and this is what it shows. It, the good news is, the bad news is, if you eat a lot of cholesterol, you'll get clogged up. The good news is, if you stop eating it, within three weeks, the body will flush it all out of your system. It takes how long? Three weeks. Three weeks. Serum means how much is in the bloodstream. Here this person had blood cholesterol 235. They stopped eating it. Three weeks later, it dropped to 155. They start eating it again. High cholesterol diet. With the 270. They stopped eating it. Three weeks later, it dropped to 160. So if you stop eating it, the body says, whew, thank you. And it starts clearing that cholesterol out of your blood. And if it's not in your blood, it won't get stuck behind your blood. Alcohol consumption raises blood pressure. I'm not going to spend any time on that. If you're drinking alcohol, go to the non-alcoholic drinks. They make wine that's non-alcoholic. Drink grape juice. Drink <laughs> limeade. I don't want no limeade. Okay.
okay, well, I'll pray with you afterwards. <laughs> but you need to cut down that alcohol. Alcohol raises the blood pressure. A lot of Christian people drink social drinks, and they need to actually move away from it. You can get to victory if you pray and recognize what it's doing to your body. Um, <coughs> alcohol causes the blood vessels to constrict, and they decrease the amount of urine that the kidneys make. And that makes more fluid in your blood vessels, and that's how alcohol raises your blood pressure. <coughs> Exercise lowers hypertension, and they found that even calisthenics and weightlifting will bring your blood pressure down. Even if you didn't do any walking, you just did some jumping jacks, some push-ups, just something to get the blood into your muscles, it would actually bring your blood pressure down. They've shown resistance training lowers blood pressure. Here it is. There's a documentation. Resistance training. They started doing resistance training, blood pressure fell, men and women. So any kind of exercise brings the blood pressure down. We need to be more active. Everybody stand up. Stick your arms up. Turn a, turn a quarter turn. Quarter turn. A little arm circle. Shake that leg. Take the other leg. Pull your, butt, pull your, your shoulder blades back. Down. Pick your chin up. Mm. Okay, sit down. So, so weight training will lower your blood pressure, and what lowers it even better is, what does it say here? Aerobic training. Aerobic training means you get winded. Whatever you're doing, you're you got to get winded. You have oxygen debt. And when you get an oxygen debt, that's a good thing. The body says, okay, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to make some things right. And it does better than resistance training. And this is the graphic here. Um, and the group A did aerobic training. And that's the blue group. They dropped lower. The, the red group is the ones that lifted weights. It did drop, but not as much as those that did the what? The oh, they're out there doing that walking. Here's the numbers. This will be on your quiz on Wednesday night. I'll bring a cookie bar for you if you get this right. What are the numbers? The numbers are 2, 3.5, and 7. What are the numbers? 2, 3.5, 7. What does the number 2 mean? It's the number 2 hours per week of aerobic exercise is necessary in order to have normal body function. How many hours of aerobic per week? Two. It's actually 17 minutes, but I have 20 minutes a day because I'm very generous to you. What is 3.5? 3.5 is the numbers of hours per week necessary to arrest and reverse chronic degenerative disease. That works out to how many minutes per day? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. If you want to lower your blood pressure, you've got minimum 30 minutes a day of being winded. You're walking so fast, you're winded. 30 minutes a day will reverse. It will stop its advancement and reverse it. What is seven? seven six, six, six. Rapid reversal. Chronic degenerative disease. I'm going to back this up. So what is two? What is two? Two hours. To, 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 to be what? Normal. Normal. Two hours to have for liver function, heart function, lung function, kidney function to be normal. 20 minutes a day. Minimum. What is 3.5? It's 30. Hours per week to reverse what? Degenerative. Chronic degenerative disease. And what is 7? Rapid. 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 Rapid reversal. If you are getting less than 20 minutes a day, you are not normal. You're what the scientists call sedentary. And sedentary people have a whole constellation of health problems. Mm -hmm. If you're not getting winded 20 minutes a day, you do not have normal liver function, lung function, heart function, kidney function. It's subnormal. You are not normal. And you're laying the foundation for something catastrophic 30 years from now. And that's most of America. And that's why the nursing homes are full of people 60 years old. They said the same thing. Do you think that they said when they were 20, when I get to be 60, I'm going to be in a nursing home and hooked up in a bed? They didn't say that. What they said is, it's not going to hurt me. That's what they said. And what happens is, the reaping years comes later on. Because what kind of lifestyle was it? Sedentary. 
And I bet if I were to give a quiz here and I start asking these people, we have sedentary people here in this room right now. Yes. You're not getting it. And the whole purpose of the seminar is for you to shake yourself and say, it's time to make a change. I gotta get consistent. I gotta, I gotta get the victory. Let's move on. How does exercise lower blood pressure? What happens is, as the heart pumps, those calcified vessels get stretched against their will and they become more elastic and then they just stay more relaxed and there's more blood flowing. So you just going through all that chest pain, <sighs> It eventually gets easier as your blood vessels are forced to be stretched by that heart rate that's, that's, um, that's accelerated. The other thing is that the body actually sends a hormonal signal that says, relax the vessels, relax the vessels. We need more blood. And so it opens up capillaries. As soon as we start exercising, the nervous system sends a message to open blood vessels, I think I have a picture of it. The body says, I need more glucose. I need more oxygen. So it says, open the vessels. And when it opens those vessels, your blood pressure does what? It falls. It has a new place to flow. So exercise is actually training your body to lower that pressure. So if you start walking, you're actually training your body to just open up vessels that were shut. And the body starts sending nervous signals to open it all up. There it is. The blood vessels open, and so now the, the vessels can hold what? A greater volume of blood, and the pressure falls. What's the best way to do it? If somebody in this group starts a walking program, I will feel that I've got paid. <laughs> somebody that's not walking, they start walking. That just, just overjoys my heart, because that's my whole purpose. If I can get somebody to change their habits, now we're on our way. Because this habit right here, it's the best remedy for diseased bodies. By it, the circulation will be greatly improved. Morning exercise in the morning, it's the surest safeguard. Mm -hmm. what, what time did it say? Morning. Morning. morning exercise and walking. It's the surest safeguard against colds, coughs, congestions, lungs, inflammation, and a hundred other diseases. If you can get up in the morning, get on your mini trampoline for just five minutes and just do that, or you're on a treadmill in your house for just five minutes, it'll change your whole body system. You should try to get to 30 minutes, but just getting up because you've been laying down all night horizontal and the blood's been pooling in this area. You've got to get up and get that blood out of there, into the legs, into the brain, and you'll become a different person. Mini trampoline. Five minutes on the trampoline has a tremendous effect. Roving is that you walk a little, you run a little. After you've been walking for a while, you gotta just jog with just three houses or two houses, then walk. Then jog, two houses, then walk. Do a little bit of running in between your walking. That's called roving. Gets your heart rate up. It strengthens the bones, ligaments, and does a lot of that. Stress and hypertension. You know what the plumbers say? What did the plumbers say? Pressure the <laughs> You're under pressure all the time, it's going to cause problems for you. It's going to cause problems. You got to, whatever that problem is, you got to get some counseling, get some money. Amen? Get some money. Because <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> okay. stress will cause your blood pressure to rise. I'm not going to go all through the reasons why. But it does cause blood pressure, and they know it, and the hormone cortisol is what causes it. I'm not going to go through that. Save ourselves time. I used to work with a man that used to be in the military, in the intelligence department, and he used to say this all the time. He said, Skeet, there are no stressful conditions, only what? Stress. Stressful reactions. He says, we go undercover and we have to run 20 miles in one night and do something very complicated and very dangerous, and we are taught to do it cool, calm, and collective. And he says, we're taught to keep our blood pressure down, to keep our heart rate down, and to keep positive and focused. And he says, we've learned that you don't have to be stressed. When rain is coming down, snow and ice, he says, it doesn't have to bother you. Mm -hmm. And if it does bother you, they'll weed you out. They're looking for guys that say, I can do this, and I can do it with a smile on my face. 
And so we have to just change our response to stress. We have to just say, you know what? I'm not going to let this stress me. I'm going to do it with a smile on my face. We can actually choose to stay calm. But it takes prayer and it takes practice. And um, this shows two. This is a man under the same conditions and he's all stressed. This is the same man. He's not stressed at all. He has a different attitude. And he's saying, I can handle it. I'm on top of it. I'm going to get it done. I'm not going to talk about this. Our time is up. Positive self-talk, you've heard me say this many times before, we have to start talking positive. We have to start saying, I can do it, and I'm happy about it. we got to just start talking that way. Positive self-talk changes our whole attitude and gives us a much more success. When you're murmuring and complaining, you make your task twice as hard. When it's time to go for your walk, you say, man, it's so hot out there. I don't want to do this. And you're putting your shoes on. You just made it three times this hard. <laughs> you got to say, man, it's warm and wonderful. And I'm going to have a, a wonderful time out here. And you got to talk yourself into having a wonderful time. You just can't be, oh, my trick knee, my back, back is going to You, you, you got to talk yourself out of it. You got to start talking positive all the time. Obviously, the merry heart does this. If you can get a few pounds off, brothers and sisters, it makes it a lot easier. Let me tell you something. If you are overweight and you can drop 50 pounds, you can get a thousand people to follow your Instagram. Because people are looking for somebody that made a success because it's hard to lose weight. And if you figure that out, you'll be a little celebrity. Bonnie Love's daughter, I'm not going to call her name. She lost 100 pounds, yeah. 100 pounds, and she looks good. She when I see her, I'm like, whoa, you've just changed your whole look. And the wonderful thing about it, when you talk to her, her personality is brighter. Her, she's more cheerful. I mean, it's like her whole character has changed. And it's interesting, when I asked, I said, how did you get on this weight loss? She said, I was talking to my children about losing weight, and they said, Ma, you'll never lose weight. And when they said that to her, something clicked. She said, I'm going to show you. And now she's lost 100 pounds. She, walked, she started out walking an hour a day. Her first day, she said, I'm gonna, her legs were sore. She said, I got to do this. And she walked away from that weight. Now she's a weightlifter. She's doing bodybuilding now. She said, she looks good. And that weight loss has caused her blood pressure to fall. And here's the proof right here. It's just very clear. As your weight comes down, this is the, the red line is the weight loss. Here's the diastolic and systolic. It just follows your weight loss. Okay. You lose 10 pounds, your blood pressure is way lower. You lose 20 pounds, it's lower still. Because the heart doesn't have to pump as hard. It's like, whoo, praise God, less tissue. I don't have to oxygenate all that tissue. Heart can slow down, blood pressure drops, it's wonderful. Blood pressure falls if you lose weight because the heart can pump what? Slower. Slower. And if the heart can pump what? Less It doesn't have to pump as much blood. It can pump softer. And that makes your blood pressure go down. I already mentioned this. Sweating in the Russian steam chair or in a hot tub or just standing in a hot shower for 10 minutes, you'll come out, you'll be sweating. That's enough to cause you to lose quite a bit of salt. I don't know if you know that sweat is composed of the same things that urine is composed of. So much so that skin has been called the third kidney. You can sweat out a lot of sodium just um, going out and getting a sweat. You can lose as much as 500 milligrams in 15 minutes. So that's three extra um, vegan sausages <laughs> squeeze in if you get in the stink bag, okay? You got to have a strategy what you going to do, okay? I told my wife, I got to go to the stink bag. I got to go. If I can get rid of this extra sodium. Water drinking helps hypertension also. I'm not going to go through all of that. Most people are dehydrated because they, um, um, if you don't drink enough water, you lose the thirst sensation. It goes away. You don't feel thirsty, but you are dehydrated. Oh. The good news is, is once you start drinking again, that thirst sensation will return. 
you drink water, two quarts of water a day for a week, the following week, as soon as you stop, you feel thirsty. Mm -hmm. Where you weren't feeling it before, you, your thirst sensation has returned. Chronic pains should be first interpreted as a water shortage in the area where the pain is felt. If you have headache, chest pain, back pain, stomach pain, or leg pain, the first thing you should think is I'm dehydrated. And I'm dehydrated in my legs, that's why they're, I'm dehydrated in my brain, that's why it's hurting. That's how it should first be interpreted. I'm not going to go through that. Dehydration causes the capillaries to what? Blood vessels to constrict. Anyway. You get dehydrated, boom, 20% constriction, and it drops. Water will actually lower your blood pressure. There's herbs for hypertension. Garlic is an excellent one. Um, cayenne pepper increases the elasticity of the cells. Here's your Jamaica sorrel. It um, reduces the blood pressure in rosemary. And all mushrooms lower yes. blood pressure dramatically. Yes. Wow. Yes. Dramatically. Yes. Reaching blood, um, mushrooms greatly lower the blood pressure. Hawthorne berry widen blood vessels and also parsley. Here's fennel. It has 10 compounds to lower blood pressure. We've got to the end of our slide program, finally. Many of us are living a lifestyle. It's like a tire that has a defect. And if you drive on a tire like this too long, guess what? It's going to blow out. And that's what happens. I've had high blood pressure for 20 or 30 years. They have a blowout, and it's not good. I had a cousin that was a year older than me. And at the tender age of about 47, she had a massive stroke. Changed her whole life. Changed her whole life. And she was damaged. She lost her job, had to live with her parents. 15 years later, she had a second stroke, and it took her life. She didn't change her lifestyle in between those two strokes. I think her life could have been spared. And it's the lifestyle that's giving roots to the great tree of disease. And what's the hypertension program? What's the foundation? Exercise. Walking. Hour a day. Changing the diet. Four times as much potassium as sodium. And then some other things. Your blood pressure will come down. People, they don't <laughs> like to eat the natural things. They complain. But this is actually the source of your health, is right here. They're complaining about their exercise, but they got to change their attitude. They got to start talking positive about making those changes. We've got to say, I reject those negative thoughts that you're trying to put in my mind. I'm going to take my problem to the Lord and have Him help me. And that's the way that the axe is laid. The root of the tree. Thank you for sitting so long. How many of you know you got some work to do? Amen. You'd like the Lord to give you extra strength. Bow your head and we're going to close in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we've been sitting for a super long time tonight, but we see that your word and, your, and the science shows that we don't have to be saddled with high blood pressure or any other disease. Lord, give us grace, give us strength. You saw all the hands that were raised just now that people are saying, Lord, we want to do better, and I pray that you would give them grace, encouragement, and strength. As we go home this evening, as we lay down on our bed, speak to us, whisper through your spirit, and tell us the things that we need to change, and give us grace.